This is Conspiranormal. Well, this is um, the 300th episode. And we're going to do a long show for you guys. We've got uh, pretty much like a three-parter tonight so this will be pretty interesting i don't know we're gonna divide this into two or probably enough material for like two or three shows we'll figure it out but uh we've got a guest on that is a patron of ours that has graciously agreed to come on and talk about some research that he has been doing um joe kistner joe welcome to conspire normal man thanks i'm happy for the invite and flattered to be here yeah absolutely um uh, I've enjoyed. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I've enjoyed the show for quite a while now here, and uh, it's uh, you guys. I I have to give you credit and a little fanboy stuff here is that uh, I have not found another show that can have an intelligent conversation by the hosts on so many different topics. Uh, yeah, I was really dumbstruck. Wow! Thank and you. I, Thanks a lot. You guys, yeah. you guys do an exceptional job. And, you know, I'd encourage everybody else, you know, that Patreon stuff, it's not about the bonus material. It's not about uh, the uh, screensavers and wallpaper. It's about being able to support somebody like uh, like you guys that put such an effort into their content right? and putting it out week after week. So uh, all the other stuff, the little bonus stuff is just extras. I mean, for five bucks a month, you can't beat it. Yeah, yeah, uh, and we thanks a lot, Joe. Yeah, that that means a lot to us. Um, that we, you know, we we put a lot into this, and it really um, helps to hear that get that feedback from from listeners, you know, especially. And to really, what we're doing today is kind of really a tribute to our listeners uh, because we got, I had this idea because, like, in the um, and I'll probably go back over this later, but. You know, episode 100, we did, I had guests on that I had had from, for the last few years before that. And that was like the big chin dig that we had. Episode 200, I had like Joshua Cutchin and Randall Carlson on. And now this, but I was thinking we had just done not too long ago, just a few months ago, the Strange Realities Conference. And I wanted to do i didn't you know i'd already gotten a lot of people here for that and so i was like well what can we we were kind of like we're kind of like in the crunch like what can we do who could we possibly get here and then i came up with the idea of like we just need to have like an all listeners show yeah and so um you i think i don't know i think that uh, i had hit you up about coming on because you'd been in some contact with me about some of the stuff that we're going to talk about with you and um I got you on, and now like we're going to do like a Zoom recording later. I've got a couple of people here that are local, going to talk about a UFO experience coming on here just to, in, after we're done here with you. And so, you know, just this is really a tribute to our listeners and the people that have really helped. It sounds so cliche, but it's like without you guys, where would we be? You know, giving us feedback, um, listening to the show, supporting us, and... You know, it's it's a great thing to have people that really appreciate us. So, you know, thank you, Joe, for saying that. Absolutely. Um, and one of the coolest things about doing this is that uh, people come to you with information, with stories, right? With their own takes on things and experiences, and so you get to really like collect all this. You know, so that's that's been one of my favorite things about this. Just yeah, being part of that community, yeah. getting access to all all this information that that you wouldn't otherwise. And also, too, bringing people together. Yeah. Um, you know, Joe here, he found out uh, you're in Minneapolis, right? And uh, I'm about an hour southwest, but I work okay. in Minneapolis. Yeah. So pretty close. And But, you know, Wren lives there, and we've had Wren on the show several, several times. And Joe and Wren were able to get together and have lunch or dinner a few day, a few weeks ago. You know, so like, you know, we're, it's, it's just that sense of community, I think, is really important. Yeah, I just got a text from Ren about uh, 10 minutes ago. So, oh, OK, cool. Cool. Did you tell him you're coming on? Yep. Yep. I uh, let him know that. And uh, 
Uh, we're talking about touching base again on working on some of this stuff that uh, we kind of connected with. And we've got some similar interests and some different interests that uh, are going to mesh up real well. Okay. Yeah. Let's um, let's get into this. Uh, you know, you had sent me a few weeks ago some emails about some of the stuff that you've been working on. So we're going to talk about two like missing persons cases i believe i think one is a missing persons case and there's some there's some aspects of uh some murder cases and some some other weirdness that's involved and let's get into how these well first like your background with this and how these cases kind of came on your radar well i started out with uh Oh, my daughter and I, well, er, well, let's put it this way. Early on in life, I figured out that I'd never have the, uh, probably the time or the financial ability to go investigate the mysteries of the world. So I started looking closer to home. Um, and I found, so I've got a, a Facebook page. It's called Minnesota Legend Hunters or MN Legend Hunters that I kind of started out with my daughter. And we'd research, uh, strange, unusual people, places, and things around Minnesota. It was things that I had the ability to go and research with a, you know, with an, a tank of gas, let's say. And I was quite dumbfounded about how much, how many different interesting things I found out uh, just about within the state of Minnesota. And uh, a couple of years ago, my brother published a book on Amazon with uh, about his time he spent with Prince. He used to work for him uh, years ago. Oh, nice. And and, yeah, and ended up getting pulled on a cease and desist but <laughs> from his estate. <laughs> That's like the patron saint of Minneapolis, the prince. Yeah, yeah he, uh, well, I, I saw how easy it was to publish a book, you know, via the Amazon process. And I had thought that maybe some of these stories I was working with um, on the Legend Hunters a website, you know, to compile them in time, in kind, into kind of a travel log type thing. And, of course, I jump ahead of myself, my ADD, and I thought, okay, well, if you do that, then you're going to need something to follow it up with. And I thought about examining missing persons cases or a handful of missing persons cases in Minnesota. And as I was delving into a few of them, I found one that was uh, fairly local to me. Uh, more of a sad case, not too much mysterious about it but when i was connecting people with connecting to people involved with that um uh, one of the women i was working with put me in contact with a uh the granddaughter of a woman named milda mcquillan okay and milda went missing in northern minnesota in becker county back in 1975 and she had just asked because it, it's been you know 40 almost 45 years now, if I'd be interested into just uh, looking into her grandmother's case. And that's kind of where we started out. Um, I, uh, I had learned about the uh, process of, uh, of uh, data practices in Minnesota through a, a, a double murder suicide from 1990 that I had delved into a little bit. And, uh, I went on to see if I could pursue the uh, records for, for Milda McQuillan, which is kind of interesting. I guess anybody who'd be interested in doing something like that, it's really good to get to know um, the state um, data practice data practices laws, uh, you know, of whatever state you're looking into. And I got to know Minnesota's fairly well. And it is different than I hear a lot of people ref- reference FOIA and stuff. And it is a lot different than what the... Uh, the federal um, Freedom of Information Act stuff is. There's different guidelines and things. Um, But uh, so I I sent out my letters to Becker County. And at that time, I did know about the the second case, which also occurred in Becker County in 1976. And uh, at first, uh, my request was denied. Well, denied several times. And I ended up going to the uh, State Department of uh, data practices to appeal it and uh they went under the uh they kept telling me it was an open case and they couldn't discuss it but under minnesota state law after 30 years 
either after a uh, case is permanently closed or after 30 years, it becomes public record. Okay. And by pursuing that is kind of how we ended up uh, getting them to agree to release the case files. Um, all right. So what did you find out about these cases? Well, what, first of all, what are the specifics of some of these, of these two cases? Let's start with the Milda McClellan case first. Well, Milda was uh, 71 years old. She lived, uh, uh, she was retired from St. Paul and moved out to uh, uh, Round Lake, which is near Ponsford, Minnesota. And uh, she lived there with her sister, Ida, in a cabin that they had, uh, she had built with her husband earlier on. Um, Milda was going to see uh, an acquaintance on Bad Medicine Lake, which was about, uh, I think, about 18 miles from where she was living. And she took off on the afternoon of June 17th, 1975. Um, ultimately, Milda never arrived at that residence. We found uh, um, there was reports of her talking to uh, being lost along the way. And I, I've driven the route, too. It's not real complicated, but uh, she apparently was confused along the way. She uh, ended up uh, speaking with her trash collector as she was leaving the house, and we found uh, her call, her car had stalled going up the steep hill from her house, and uh, the mailman assisted her in starting her car, and she talked to him. Um, she got directions from a truck driver and uh, some uh, gentlemen pouring a foundation for a cabin up there, and they were the last people she had contact with. Uh, the next morning, uh, her sister, when she hadn't returned home, called the sheriff's office. And it uh, initially, they did a search around with the, in the area with four-wheel drives and, uh, and uh, were not able to locate the vehicle. Okay. Um, the next day, they, did, they ended up doing a a uh, search with an airplane for about three hours and weren't able to locate anything. And then that evening, uh, Milda's son-in-law and daughter had, ke had uh, came up there from the cities. And her uh, son-in-law, along with a neighbor, were back driving a, a four-wheel four -wheel drive vehicle and went back on an abandoned logging trail. And as they were giving up because they figured she'd never turn down the road like that. As they were turning around, the headlights hit the car, uh, stuck underneath some pine trees. And uh, that's kind of where it starts. That's where it starts. Okay. Yeah, it's initially they thought that, you know, she, uh, because she was kind of confused on her way there, that she thought, um, she might have lost her way, got stuck, and began to walk. But the following day, they went out to uh, search the area. And her car really wasn't stuck. There had been a lot of rain over that time. But her car seemed to be more stashed within the trees there. Okay. Um, the initial day, they didn't find any evidence. But uh, from what I gathered, the next day when they went out again, they found a rain cap and a belt along a um in some trees along a uh, swampy area and it's funny though because that's when they realized that they searched that same area the day before and those things weren't there right so you've got some similarity there to kind of like the missing 411 stuff where things get you, get you search for something or a body or something shows up inexplicably the next day in a place that you've already searched yeah, and it was kind of weird because I, I got the uh, Pilatus uh, Missing 411 Eastern United States book for Christmas. <coughs> right. Excuse me. And I uh, found uh, she's actually included in there. There's a very small snippet, but and the details are a little off. I don't think offhand she fits the criteria for for the Missing 411 stuff, but okay. uh, so there's definitely. Do you expect like more like a foul play kind of thing or a motive by someone? Yeah. To, 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 no uh, body was ever found, correct? Yeah, the body was never found. And it, when you look back at the newspaper articles and stuff, it, um, a local paper up there did a story on her about a year ago, just kind of as a reflecting back thing. And when you start reading these stories, you find how uh, 
over time, a story morphs and becomes kind of uh, more folklore. Um, there was talk of her being, uh, there was uh, boat motor thieves in the area back then, and, and there was speculation that these guys took a canoe out to Bad Medicine Lake, and and uh, she had some call, somehow stumbled across their nefarious activities, and they uh, tied her to a boat motor and dumped her in the middle of the lake. Mm. And But, you know, I to go back to when I actually obtained the records from the sheriff's office, I got to. I went up there and met with the sheriff or one of his uh, one of his sergeants for a while, and it turned out about half of the case file was actually missing. Uh, it's no. I think after forty years, things kind of uh, fall out and disappear. Like there was no, there was no statements or anything from any of the people involved at that time. However, I did find uh, documentation about the boat motor thieves. Uh, they were both, uh, they were kind of, uh, in their late teens and, and, uh, they were both apparently did steal boat motors, but they were both given polygraphs and stuff like that and convinced that they had really nothing to do with it. Okay. And this was what, what year was this? 1975, June 3rd 1975. of 19, or okay. June 17th, 1975. So it's, it's a little tough because a lot of the people, um, that were involved in the case are, are getting up there. The people that she right. was going to visit um, are long past. Um, I yeah, did get a chance guess, to talk to one. A they would have of the been deputies. in their 70s, I guess, then. So, yeah, probably. Yeah, there. I did get to meet with, uh, I met with her, or I got to speak with the garbage man that spoke with her when she left the, when she was leaving the house. Um, he's now a, uh, uh, tribal uh, representative up on the White Earth Indian Reservation up there, and uh, so I had an interesting conversation with him. He was well, he was never so those things kind of get forgotten over time. Um, I met with the uh, Water Patrol deputy that was involved with the initial search back then, um, and I got to interview a few of her neighbors. Uh, which had some interesting things in there. There's some uh, variations in the story. Um, uh, one story. One account in the newspaper says that her purse was never found, and uh, uh, one of the people involved with the search states that uh, he was a little disappointed how the uh, whole scene was handled because at first they thought it was just uh, the case of an elderly woman that wandered off, sure. and they didn't treat the vehicle as you know necessarily a crime scene. Yeah. And he reported that her purse was actually found in the car. And he gave me details about a couple of checks that were in her purse along with some cash. Okay. So they didn't yeah, they didn't treat they got some details wrong and they um they said that the purse was in the car but it really wasn't. Yeah, um, it's it's hard it's hard to separate the fact from fiction cuz everybody, you know, after that much time there um, memories kind of fade, and it's you know kind of yeah. trying to sort everything out and find the actual. Did you speak facts. to like the? Did you speak to some of the original investigators of the case? Well, the main investigator. When I found out that half the case file was missing, <laughs> I was going to reach out to the uh, <clears throat> deputy that initially investigated it has passed away, and I know back in those days, uh, an investigator probably carried a lot of. Uh, a lot of his files with him. This is up in Lake Country. It's a big county, right? Um, lots of forest and lakes, and and uh, where an investigator back then might have, might very well have carried a lot of his paperwork in the car with him. But I did reach out to his son, and uh, he said his father never brought anything like that home. So, uh, him having the hopes of him having any records stashed away in a box in the attic kind of disappeared there. So you're kind of feeling out, uh, trying to fill in the missing gaps. Um, with the McQuillan case, <clears throat> excuse me, we did, uh, there was some suspicion on the people she was going to visit, uh, said she never arrived there. Um, uh, there was some uh, people that came to visit them and, and said they were very standoffish, 
did not want to help in the uh, in the uh, the search for her, and the fact that her car was actually found uh, just within like a quarter mile of their cabin. And uh, we did recently find, thanks to a guy I worked with, who brought in an old plat book from uh, from the area. We did find a piece of land that uh, one that the uh, the male that she was going to visit actually owned back then, and his kid, his grandkids own it today, and it's about uh, a couple miles south of the property, and we determined that that land was never searched back then. So we're hoping that if things work out, um, this spring we'll be able to get permission and that the sheriff's office will be able to bring some cadaver dogs back there and at least search the property. It's something that you never know what's going to turn out, but at least, the very least, needs to be crossed off, you know? Yeah, after that long, you'd think the cadaver dogs would be able to pick up on something? We're talking like 40 plus, year, 40 plus years ago, and 45 years ago at this point. Yeah, I spoke with a, a, a woman who handles cadaver dogs, and she does not think it would be a problem at all. Interesting. Um, it just works better usually in the, the spring or the fall when there's less foliage and stuff. Okay. Now, there's the second case. Now, now both of these are in the same general area, correct? Yeah, and, and just to note, the, the Milda McQuillan case, one of the interesting things on that, um, there was a lot of psychics brought in on that one. Yeah. And unfortunately, yeah. they're... they're uh, uh, some of the information from them has been lost, but they uh, actually had, I believe her name is a Kathleen Ray from California. They had hired her to give a, a reading that was ended up being tape recorded. And uh, Kathleen Ray is, uh, I think she's passed away now, but she was on quite a few television shows back in the day. And I think there was, she was on this psychic detectives uh back in the early 2000s. And she's got a fairly big name. But unfortunately, the tape recording she made of her readings has disappeared. Uh, there might be a copy stashed away someplace, but it was all turned over to the sheriff's office and and uh, and disappeared with the rest of the stuff. Yeah, and it was lost, yeah. yeah. And there was an, also a Reverend Green from uh, Canada that uh, asked for the family to send her a piece of... Uh, Milda, Milda's uh, clothing or jewelry, and uh, they sent they sent Reverend Green a ring, and she sent back a report to the sheriff's office about her readings on the on the uh, on what she felt happened to Milda. She did return the ring too, but there again, that's another another piece of uh, file that's missing. And I did I have tried tracking down Reverend Green and haven't been successful yet, but I think I've located her with the Anglican Church. Um, Okay, so the second case is the Rustness case, and this is about a year later, I believe, 1976. Yeah, this, yeah, this was in uh, April 3rd of 1976. Okay. Um, this occurred outside of Wolf Lake, Minnesota, which is also in Becker County. Uh, this was a little more complicated. I did get the sheriff's office files on the case, but it was turned over to the uh, Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, the BCA. And so I was able to obtain the uh, <clears throat> the uh, sheriff's portions of the file without incident, but I, uh, they were hesitant they could, about uh, turning over the BCA's portion, which was the bulk of it. Um, but eventually the Rustness, uh, uh, one of Rustness's Bernard Russell's sons had contacted me and I'd been working with a son and a daughter and I was able to obtain the, the BCA file through them. So yeah, that was a, uh, April 3rd of, uh, 1976, about 11 o'clock at night, a, uh, young woman was driving down the gravel road in front of their house and noticed a, uh, flames from a basement window on the North west corner of the house she drove into wolf lake to uh notify the fire department and at about that same time there was a carload of five uh people driving north on uh, highway 43 and they noticed flames coming out of the trees and pulled up on the pro pulled up to the property 
Interesting thing, when they entered the property, they found out the driveway had been plowed up. It's in the spring in Minnesota and what they, you know, some of these farm places, they, they basically turn the driveway over to help it dry out. And they had noted that it was, uh, their car almost got stuck going up the driveway and no other vehicle had driven, driven onto the property. When they arrived, they found like, uh, the house was, uh, the roof line of the house was becoming involved and there was flames coming out of the upstairs window. So this was both reported to be about 11 PM that night. Uh, they tried making entry into the house and they couldn't, the doors were locked and they shut off the natural, the, the LP tank to the house. And after making some efforts to get in, they ended up running back into town to also notify the fire department. Um, it was a Bernard Rusness and a Peggy McKay that lived out there with their son, their eight year old son, Brian. Um, the house eventually burned to the ground except for I think there was one small part of a wall that was left standing. Um, State Fire Marshal came out. um, uh, County Deputy came out. And as they were going through the the debris, they were only able to find one body. And that was the body of the eight-year-old son, Brian. I believe they found basically the upper torso wrapped in a blanket. And then they did find one extra skull out there but the bodies of bernard and peggy were never located and uh this brought up a lot of speculation to as to what happened being that it didn't seem like anyone else was on the property at that time uh it goes on there's a lot of bizarre weird details that go with this i um there was reports of an airplane seen flying around the area that evening around that time. And uh, when they searched the property the next day, they actually found uh, like tire tracks in the pasture behind the house. Another person who was uh, spearing fish in a creek um, down from the house claims he heard uh, gunshots. Um, A series of like, I think, five gunshots a minute or two apart. And, uh, so that's kind of where we stand at this time. I did, uh, when you start looking into it, everything I've, see, I've got, when I started looking through the whole case file, there's a lot of information there, a lot of interviews, and then a uh, whole pile full of, uh, chicken scratch notes. And, what I found really interesting, there's so many details, so many rumors about this. Um, I went down several rabbit holes. The interesting part is that every one of them led somewhere and led to an interesting story themselves, but I haven't been able to connect anything back to the, uh, yeah, the incident itself. This gets a little weird. Some of the tangential stuff that's around this one. Yeah. Well, one of the, One of the things was, is that, you know, they could have very um, easily left on their own and disappeared, which still, it's kind of, the thing that doesn't make sense with any of the scenarios is that the death of the eight-year-old son, you know, there's all kinds of speculation that people were trying to cover things up and that, but it would, you know, it would almost look more suspicious uh, with the parents missing than if they would have been found alongside them in the fire. Uh, one of the strange things about that night is uh, all the uh, the sheds and everything were left open. Um, he had guns in a shed outside the house. Um, a hood was left open on a vehicle that he was working with. And, uh, and it was told by some of his friends that he was the type of guy that locked every door behind him. And in early April, too, the sun sets fairly early. So it kind of lets it makes you wonder too, is if he had all that stuff open yet. I mean, ap- after dusk, I'm sure he would have locked things up for the day. So it kind of wondering how and when the incident started out there or whatever did happen. Um, there was also some reports uh, 
three or four reports seeing stating that these people believe they saw Bernard after the fire, um, anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of months later. Okay. Um, hmm. uh, gentleman reports talking to him in a restroom about the fire, not recognizing him off uh, offhand and reporting that he believed it was, was Bernard Rusness. Um, the deputy that was in charge went down and actually questioned some people. A few people thought that they did see him. Um, like a month later in Moorhead, Minnesota, a woman reported seeing uh, Bernard was had a, a fake eye, which was very distinguishable. And a woman reported uh, seeing someone t- that met his matched his description uh, uh, at an intersection. And the reason she noted is that the kids were kind of looking at him and, and how they could notice the deformity of his eye. And he was uh, said to be driving a Vega station wagon that was kind of gold in color. And in some of these uh, notes in the files, I mean, some of these chicken scratch things, I did find out that a uh, Vega was stolen uh, stolen from a salvage yard that they that Bernard used to work for and his, uh, and his uh, I guess, common-law wife, Peggy, did work for at the time. However, it's, you know, you, I called the... Uh, the uh, Fargo PD, and they don't have any records going back that far as far as the the stolen vehicle would go. And then uh, around Memorial Day, um, there was a report that a couple uh, from Osage, Minnesota, um, met Bernard and Peggy at a lake and ended up having, went fishing and had a few beers with them. The only thing I can't figure out, I'm still trying to get a hold of the gentleman that, uh, that that saw them that night is that if he actually knew them prior to this or if they just happenstanced across each other and had the you know had a beer and bs for a while so that's part of that there and uh there's uh another aspect in the uh this is kind of where i got started uh, getting ren involved <clears throat> Excuse me. There was a uh, a letter in the file uh, dated November of 1978 by an inmate in the North Dakota penitentiary system, okay. and it's just signed simply Terry M. And I don't know. I might have sent you a copy of that one. Yeah, and, I, yeah, yeah. You did. Yeah, yeah. You sent a PDF of it. Yeah, it's a handwritten yeah. letter. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And. Terry states that there's a guy in the prison, and I'll use his name, Bob Warner, uh, because he lives under an alias now, I know, um, that he was an exorcist, and he knew something about um, these devil worshipers, as he called them, that were after him, and uh, he was aware of of what happened to this boy in Wolf Lake in uh, April of 76. And he went on to say that these people that were uh, after this Bob Warner and that could have been involved with this were also involved with the uh, kidnapping and decapitation of a a pregnant woman from McCluskey, uh, North Dakota, in October of 1976. And uh, I uh, I did research the McCluskey thing. I talked to one of the, uh, the chief deputy of the county up there. It's a very small county, and they're unaware of anyone at any time in that time frame that ever went missing from the area. So that I haven't been able to st- substantiate. Um, I did find a case that might fit that in frame out in Pennsylvania, but I have no idea how that might connect, you know, directly. Um, and it turns out as I found, there was no real follow up on that letter. Um, there was another letter written by Warner. Um, a few months later, um, I stating that he, uh, he wanted to come clean because he was innocent, how he couldn't prove his own innocence if he didn't disclose things he knew. And he stated he knew who was responsible for the death of the boy in Wolf Lake, Minnesota. 
and wanted to kind of get it off his chest. And then as another footnote in there, he also put in that he was aware of a, who put out on a murder contract on a, uh, on a woman named Holly Guy. Um, as I looked into the guy who, that won her, I found out that he was uh, eh, basically a career criminal, nothing involved with violence, nothing involved necessarily with narcotics. I did end up finding his ex-wife from the 70s. Um, she's still in fear of him, and I you know, told her I wouldn't disclose where she lived or anything like that. But um, And she also celebrates the day of their divorce every year. Okay. I've got it on <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah, I've got it on Facebook. She actually posted it. <laughs> she buys herself something special every year on the date of their divorce. She was happy to be rid of him. <laughs> but um I've always thought that uh in every lie there's usually an ounce of truth. And I wanted to vet this guy out a little bit. The BCA when I found going through these chicken scratch notes I found a reference that it, it's nothing actually written out. It's just some handwritten notes that they they did either meet with this guy in prison after that first letter from the uh, um, Terry M. And he did give them a couple names, and it looks like they followed up on them. And when I researched the names, they were uh, I found out that they were in prison there. Uh, they were involved in a armed robbery of a hospital pharmacy in Fargo, but. Apparently, I don't know if he baited them with uh, with just some people he didn't like or something because they never pursued anything further. Incidentally, one of them does live in the Detroit Lakes area, which is right around where all this occurred. Um, but when I went to Warner's letter a little further, I did some research on the woman with the uh, the hit on her. And I found her married now here in Minnesota. And, you know, if you can imagine calling somebody out up, up out of the blue and saying, yeah, were you aware of anybody putting a contract on you 40 years ago? Well, it turned out she was a daughter of a four-term North Dakota governor um, back in the day. And she had uh, gotten some trouble and became a confidential informant for the North Dakota Drug Enforcement Unit and ended up putting a lot of people or a few people in prison. So, I mean, the likelihood of the hit being put out on her is, you know, within reason. So I gave some substance to what that letter presented. And I, I've been trying to contact this person. Um, I uh, found the community he lives in, and I spoke with one of the investigators there. And he is still there. However, he's never really had a lot of contact with him. And he is living underneath a different name now. Um, but yeah, I, I, hopefully I'll get to talk to him someday because I, I, there's obviously probably sociopathic tendencies there, but like I said, everyone, I think there's a grain of truth in everything. And if you can, you know, vet out that truth, I think would bring us a long way. Um, in that though, in, they brought, you know, that the talk about the devil cult. And I realized this was kind of in the beginning of the satanic panic back in the seventies and eighties. Right. Um, but it kind of made me start. Uh, it made me look back at, as I was doing research for my Minnesota legend hunters thing, um, a few years prior to that, I came across a posting on one of these, you know, internet boards, with some stories up from that area. I was actually looking for something called the Vergus Hairy Man, which was a, a kind of a Bigfoot legend up there. And I came across a, a, a post that mentioned a little bit about that and some, you know, his buddy's, you know, haunted basement. And then there was a reference to uh, these hooded white cultists that ran around Vergus Trail in the woods. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't make. You know, I didn't make much of it. Right. But right. One, the funny thing is, is that you know, when I went up and I met with the sheriff, um, and was talking about some of this stuff, I had mentioned in jest. It's like, yeah, I used to. You know, I heard about these white hooded 
people out running around the woods and the sheriff's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we know them. That We used to call them the white sheets. It's like, oh, well, okay, that's curious. And then uh, the next day I had met with the son of Bernard Rusness, or one of his sons, and uh, we were talking. I just kind of brought it up to him, and he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, the white sheets. He goes, we used to, he said, I think I found their compound out in the woods there, and and uh, although I think it burnt down years ago. What in the world? <laughs> and then, it, then I also, when I was digging through some stuff, uh, newspaper archives and stuff. I did find a reference back back from like 1976, 77 about the uh, sheriff's department uh, busting these kids running around town in white robes with candles. And it did state that uh, they were reprimanded because the town was already in fear of the stories of these white robed people. Um, and that's kind of where I got in touch with Wren, you know, wondering if he he had some connections and, and, you know, with the metaphysical stuff and see if he was familiar with any group that might have uh, been functioning back then. I, I can't find anything offhand. I know there was uh, uh, the Reformed Druids and stuff, but, you know, it could have been very likely that some, uh, some group owned some land up there and just uh, did their thing up there, you know, on weekends. Uh, there was also in pretty pretty major thing that i thought was this uh man i think the last name was aho that he saw something out there in the woods that was yeah well, pretty interesting yeah and that's i still never thought much about that story but i uh uh there was a the bca investigated this as a cold case in 2006 and by happenstance, uh, one of the managers where I work is a retired cop from St. Paul. And he just so happened to know this retired BCA agent quite well that worked the case. And uh, so he's actually been very supportive in uh, answering questions and uh, encouraging me, giving, some, giving me some advice. And uh, he interviewed a, a gentleman by the name of Aho who was not in the area at the time, but he uh, was telling him that he was fishing in Wolf Lake and they snagged something on the bottom of the lake. And when he pulled it up, it was a piece of a, uh, of a uh, flannel shirt. So about and how long after the rustness? This was about was four, this. about four years after four years after okay. when, when he stated that he found this. And then as kind of an incidental note, at the end of the uh, interview, he goes, you know, by the way, I don't know if it means much, but we were out fishing that it was that same year with uh, him, his son and brother and nephew, I believe. And they heard somebody yelling, daddy, daddy. And then they looked up on the shoreline and he saw two white robed hooded figures with a lantern along the shoreline, one smaller, one of taller and one of smaller stature. Hmm. And he said, by the time they got back to the shore, they were gone. So I'm going, you know, it's just crazy how those synchronicity type things kind of mesh into each other. So it gave me a little more, it made me a little more intrigued about the whole white robed uh, person's aspect of it. And that's kind of where I I started talking with Ren Collier about that. Well, so do you think if if you had to speculate do you, do you, is there a connection between these white robed figures? Because you you hate to go into some kind of like sensationalism here. I mean, like you mentioned the Satanic Panic. I mean, this very much is reminiscent of that. But is there a thought in your mind or in others' minds that these white robed figures or this group that was hiding out there in the woods? Um, I mean, it seems like a <laughs> kind of an inhospitable place to be have a commune out in the middle of the woods in northern Minnesota or, or North Dakota. But it's just, uh, is there a speculation that, that they may have been involved with some of this stuff? Or is it just some kind of weird tangent or coincidence? It's, it's well, it's strange to say the least. I don't. 
see, I've gone down so many different rabbit holes here, and every single one of them has had an interesting story at the end, but I cannot right. tie them together. Right. Now, like with the, the cultist thing, for example, there is a, a note, um, another chicken scratch note about a uh, – and in this note, a guy that worked up in the cities, I think, with with uh, Rustness, he was a, he worked in the auto industry as a mechanic, I think, and a body man and stuff. And he know he said something about a mutilated calf found on the property the year before. Yeah. And on the bottom of that, there was a woman accusing I don't know if it was Bernard or someone else of being cultists and sacrificing the family. You know, there's no substantiation to that anywhere, but uh, it, however it was mentioned. Uh, now, with the mutilated calf, I did find another reference to that in some other notes from the year prior, and I dug into that a little bit and found one other um, cattle mutilation in the area around the same time. So I started digging into the whole, because back in the uh, mid-late 70s, Minnesota did have a rash of cattle mutilations. And as I was digging into that online, um, there you're, you find a lot of redundant information. There's basically about four or five paragraphs that's repeated everywhere. And this involved uh, uh, the U.S. Attorney General's Office in Minneapolis investigating it. And there was a uh, Don Flickinger, who was an ATF agent, who turns out ended up investigating these cattle mutilations with and at the request of Dr. J. Allen Hynek, which was kind of intriguing. Um, I kind of wanted to find out if there was any tie-ins to that, and I ended up tracking down the ATF agent, the retired ATF agent, out in Montana. And surprising enough, I left him a message, and he called me back about 15 minutes later, and we had quite the conversation. Uh, back in that day, they came across, uh, he was telling me about some of the cases. He didn't know about anything that was that far north, but there was one relatively within about 45, 45 miles from this incident. Um, but they ended up coming across uh, an inmate, I believe, in Texas and an inmate in Oklahoma who stated that a group they were involved with um, was responsible for these cattle mutilations up in Minnesota. And uh, he ended up bring, uh, questioning them. They In the newspaper accounts have these guys, this stuff is all in the record. Um, from the newspaper, uh, Flickinger couldn't remember what group they were involved with. The newspaper says they're involved with a group called Sons of Satan, which as far as I know is a motorcycle club, and I never heard of being involved with anything like that right right but which, which um, with, with and also what a you know generic name too for a satanic cult oh I mean. yeah <laughs> <laughs> well they ended up bringing up these guys up to minnesota um for questioning and they claimed that they were uh, they were practicing they had a list of 14 individuals that they were going to uh they were going to go after some political figures in the same manner. They claim they already did uh, kill 10 people down in Oklahoma someplace. They did search for that site and never found anyone. But there was a guy named Judge Miles Lord who was a U.S. Uh, judge up here. And I remember from a kid, he was involved in a lot of big uh, major cases back, back in the day. And it sounds like he might have been on the list, and he encouraged the U.S. Attorney General to start investigating this a little bit further. And now when I, I, I talked to Flickinger, and he felt that, in essence, these guys were just trying to get out of their own situations in the prisons in Texas and Oklahoma, where the other one was at. One of them actually escaped from jail. And he didn't remember this part. He had mentioned some, one of them escaping, but I found a newspaper article about it. He was being held in the Carver County Jail in Chaska, Minnesota. And he ended up escaping, took a uh, city cop hostage and stole a squad car. And he ended up being later on in the day. Like I said, it just gets, these stories just, go out everywhere yeah, yeah um and 
in the long run, he kind of, uh, the ATF agent kind of discounted their story. Um, one reason was he didn't think it was actually possible for them to pull off some of the stuff that he saw. However, there was a footnote too, though. It mentioned in a newspaper article, and I had to bring it up to him. I said, were you ever in fear for your life or anything? And because a newspaper article made it sound like it was nasty. Um, but he goes, no, no, no. And he said, he goes, although I woke up one morning at our house and I went outside to my garage and found the word stop painted in blood on my garage door. But yeah, that's about <laughs> nothing weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, he goes, that's about nothing disturbing. It. No, and it, it's kind of interesting though. He went to some of the cases and, and I think there was a uniqueness about the ones, the cases that took place across Minnesota and into South Dakota and North Dakota um, as about how they were handled. It was quite intriguing because he said he cannot figure out how any of it could have actually happened. Um, uh, he found cattle in the middle of a snowy pasture with no footprints, uh, nothing even remotely close to it, they're drained of blood, had an ear cut off, the lips were removed, along with the genitalia. Mm -hmm. um, but yet there's no sign of blood or human footprints anywhere. Yeah, that's pretty and much found the typical another... story of a you know, case of a cattle mutilation, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of intriguing to talk to him, and he's like going, he, he the guy, I mean, you're talking to a federal agent after all, and he was still totally miffed to this day. But there again, it, he, it kind of brought me back into that whole cult aspect. And, you know, when I was talking to Rent, he introduced me to the Hellier series with the Hellier series, uh, docuseries with the New Kirks and stuff. Oh, yeah. And yeah. if you want to start getting into, uh, synchronicities, which gets a little wild for me, but I know a lot of that's, um, stuff took place in their little docu series, and uh, anyone who hasn't watched it, season one is interesting. Season two is intriguing, and they get into a lot working with the synchronicities that they come across with uh, while they're dealing with their their case. Um, I did find out that around that time there was a a cult operating uh, out of well. Uh, branch of it was operating out of Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, it was known as the Process. Yeah, the Process and, Church of the Final Judgment. Yeah, yeah. And there's there was uh, implications that they were involved with a um, a murder out in California. And as you delve into this, um, it goes into the whole Son of Sam thing. Is this the Arliss Perry murder? I think is what you're referring to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Out right, in California. Yeah. And it turns out that uh, uh, Berkowitz had some uh, ties with that and that one of the actual sons of Sam, Berkowitz's neighbor in New York, was found dead in, uh, I believe, Mandan, North Dakota, of what they initially thought was a suicide. Yeah, I remember hearing that. Yeah, I've read that before. Yeah. So it, it's right. kind of it's kind of crazy, and I mean, if you want to believe the synchronicity part, you know, you'd think that maybe I was led that way for a reason. However, again, it's hard to tie any of that stuff back together uh, with any of those things. There's a book, uh, "The Ultimate Evil," Maury Terry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes into all that kind of stuff. Uh, some of this stuff, you would think, some of these cults or whatever, could be used as ways to. Um, Almost like they're they're hitmen for hire. You just instead of hiring like an individual, you're hiring a group of people. I mean, that's that's one of the theories behind the Manson murders. That there would have been yeah, more that, to it than just helter skelter. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like they had their fingers in a little bit of everything back then. So it's it's kind of difficult. Like I said, I've found a lot of interesting uh, interesting rabbit holes. Have, I haven't been able to tie any of them back to, or tie the pieces together at the ends, though. But the threads of the story are uh, have been definitely intriguing. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is interesting research, Joe. Keep going with it. Keep going with it. And if you, um, I, I, this is going to be an ongoing thing. So please, you know, feel free to come back and share this with us later yeah, be, on. Whatever you you 
further discover on down the line, we, you're you're invited to come back and talk about it. Yeah, to be very, uh, I'd be very interested in doing that. It's uh, mind you, a little got to be a little guarded yet because there's still people that are alive, and you right. don't want to, uh, yeah. you know, bring out some of the further suspicions. But there's a yeah, there's a lot of intriguing elements there, and I think with the Rustness case, all it's going to take is making a connection uh, with a few names, and I really think we can find some answers. Yeah. Do you so, have a Do you have a plan to turn this into maybe a book or anything like that? Yeah. Well, right now, you know, I oh, a book would be nice, and I originally thought about maybe writing about a few some of these Minnesota missing persons cases. But um, I, I, I'm, if we can find some kind of conclusion or, put, or establish a nice story, it would, it would be nice to, you know, write it out at some point. But right now, for me, it's just the, uh, um, I guess it's more selfish reasons because it helps me uh, get off the couch, get away from Netflix and, you know, get outside of my own head. I've taken several trips up there last summer and, and uh went on the property where like this, uh, rustness incidents occurred. Um, and, uh, still trying to follow up on a few interviews. Like, uh, one of the interesting aspects of the people, the kids that uh, came up on the property in the car, uh, one of the, one of the women's statements stated that, uh, while the two guys were trying to get in the house, she went and two dogs approached her and were, and she was patting them on the head, trying to comfort them. Uh, the, the other people I interviewed uh, didn't uh, recall any dogs in this woman I haven't been able to find yet. But um, an interview with a firefighter that was one of the first on the scene states that he found two dogs in the barn when they got there. So somehow those dogs went from uh, running about the farm place into the barn. And it's not real clear as if uh, – if they were placed there after these people left or if the uh, woman that um, they approached stuck them in there for their own safety. So that's another little interesting aspect that would add a little more uh, detail to the whole thing. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds fun with the way you're mixing the, the primary sources with um, going to the actual locations and then you're kind of having, the, having these synchronicities that are leading you down certain paths and kind of revealing information to you. It's, it seems pretty interesting. Yeah, it's been it's been very intriguing, and uh, the one thing too is it, it's uh, I may not be able to provide the family with answers, but I think it's at least encouraging and helpful to them to see that it's actually after forty years, it's still kind of being examined. And I think at least I can offer them a little bit of comfort in that. And if we can come to a conclusion, it would be uh, would be all the better. Um. I know the granddaughter or the daughter of Milda too is, uh, um, she would like, you know, she's getting older. Her granddaughters are, you know, about my age, a little bit older and they would really closure to them or some sort of closure, I think would mean a lot. And hopefully, uh, if things work out with the cadaver dogs this spring, um, I don't know, I've got a decent feeling about it. Maybe we'll be able to provide a little bit anyway. Okay. Well, excellent. Yeah. Best of, best of luck to you in this endeavor. This is interesting. Thank you, Joe, for being a part of this. This has been yeah, really special. Yeah, thanks a lot. And the, the well, I, original research that no one else knows about. I mean, this is awesome. Yeah, and that's a, that's a nice part, too, in that where you can uh, – it gives you the opportunity to uh, take ownership in something, mm-hmm. you know, with the uh, – in your own research, you know, versus uh, – hunting Bigfoot or something, you know, it's right. kind of, it's all, it's your own, you know, your own work. Right. Right. All right. Well, Joe, um, thank you so much for being part of this, uh, episode 300 and guys, we'll, we'll be back, uh, with a couple of guys that saw UFO on conspiracy normal 300. continue 
with the Conspiracy Normal 300th episode. Somehow we're doing this on video. I don't know quite know how. How but, is this going to uh, work? Yeah. How is this? How is this going to work? Uh, we will, we shall see. Um, we have in the studio our good friend Joel. Hey guys. And also Robbie is here. He's off the screen at the moment because we only have three mics, so they're going to switch off. But uh, Joel has a UFO experience that he wants to share yeah. with everybody. First of all, thanks for having having us on. Yeah. We're, we're fans of the show, and uh, it's it's so awesome to, to have a show like this happening in the city we live in. Right, uh, right. Yeah. So I've been listening to Conspira Normal for about a year now, and uh, I love it. But uh, when you mentioned that you were going to have a, a fan or listener show where people could tell stories, I was like, well, I actually haven't ever shared this story in any kind of public forum. I, I remember typing up a post on Facebook where I almost decided to be like, I just got to put it out there that I've seen three UFOs. <laughs> here's how that happened. Not one, not two, but not three. Three separate experiences. Okay. Um, I don't really have a clue what they are, uh, but... I guess I'll go back to when it started was, uh, I guess it would have been around July of 2010. I was working, I was, a uh, working for a music house, a commercial music house, writing jingles and, uh, original compositions to be pitched for television commercials. Um, and we had like a certain time of the day that we had to work, like, five or six days a week we had to be there from 9 a.m to 7 p.m even if we had finished up our assignments um we kind of had to stay till the final bell rang uh which was kind of dorky and why i didn't continue <laughs> that job for more than a year uh 60 but one of the things i would do the last hour or two i was there because i would normally be finished with my compositions uh with some time to spare is i would hop on youtube and kind of satisfy my, my conspiracy itch, looking up different videos and uh, watching little documentaries. And uh, me and quite a few of my friends were really interested in researching the UFO phenomenon at the time. Uh, we also had gotten pretty involved in transcendental meditation and had been experimenting with deep trance meditation. And uh, there was a one day at work where I remember coming across this video about this guy named Stephen Greer. Right. And yep. Dr. Uh, Stephen Dr. Greer. Dr. Stephen Greer. Yep. I didn't really know who he was at the time. Since then, I've watched plenty of his lectures and seen his movies and he likes to call likes to call down UFOs and yeah. lo lock people into his lectures. And, so the first yeah. the video that I found that really stayed with me, though, didn't really show his face. It was, I think it was like a fan video or someone trying to explain this process having to do with an organization that he had started called c Right. And, uh, and so I'm watching this video that mostly was just scrolling text with like a slideshow of pictures behind it. And I don't remember what the title of the video was, but it had something to do with how, how to use meditation to summon UFOs. And I was like, all right, well, that is totally up my alley. As goofy as that sounds, that's something I definitely have to look into. So I put on this video and it literally after a brief explanation in the scrolling text gives a, a list of protocols of like things you can do that this guy, Stephen Greer supposedly claimed that if you follow like this protocol to some degree, uh, some somewhere in the neighborhood of two to three months, uh, you'll start seeing UFOs. You too can call down UFOs. Correct. Right, uh, right. And uh, I just like chuckled and I was like, well, I already do daily meditations, which was part of the protocol. Is like, I don't remember exactly. This was like, like I said, it was in 2010. It was a decade ago. And I was uh, already doing my meditation. And if I remember correctly, the protocol basically was like before and after your meditation, just put it out there as part of your like meditation experience that you are welcoming to these entities. And, and if they have peaceful intentions to feel welcome, to like reveal themselves to you, that you're not trying to exploit them. Like just to have like a, hey, if you're out there, I'm down, like let's party. Like send that vibe out to the UFOs and then eventually they'll respond. And so 
I started every day when I would do my normal meditation. I would start it off with, before I would kind of like try to go into deep trance meditation. I'd be like, hey, by the way, UFOs, extraterrestrials, anyone out there that, that, uh, if you if you're looking for communion, like, here we go. Bring it on. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm into it. I'm that's not good, scared. That's a good choice of words. Uh, I'm not scared. I'm not. But you know, I hope that you have good intentions. You know, and so I would do that before and after my meditation. Sometimes afterwards, I would. Sometimes I would do meditations outside in my backyard at the time uh, in Inglewood, uh, East Nashville, and uh, so I was doing that like every day for a couple months and. Sure enough, one day, there was a Memphis Grizzlies basketball game on. This is in Octo- By then, it was October. It was like I started doing it in like July or August-ish that year. And so it was early October, and I had walked to my friend Paul's house to watch a Memphis Grizzlies game. Uh, and I had walked my dog w- to his house with me because he had a dog, and they played well together. And uh, we watched the game. After the game was over, it had gotten dark by then, and I was walking back home with my dog. And as I turned onto Oak Street or Road, um, I noticed in three or four different front yards on Oak, on the right side of Oak, the direction I was traveling, there was like three or four pockets of people in three or four different yards. So we're talking like between nine and 12 people total. And they were kind of in these huddles, like, and I noticed one of the groups of people, there was someone pointing up in the air. So as I approached that group of people, I was like, hey, what are you guys looking at? You know, and there was a a gentleman who was like, hey, like, see that dot in the sky, that spot that it just looks kind of like a star. But if you can see where I'm pointing and you find the right star in the sky, you'll notice that it's like moving around quite a bit. Eventually, I found the spot he was talking about, and sure enough, it was like, I mean, I've I've had satellites pointed out to me before, and, you know, they kind of coast in a direction. Uh, This was definitely a dot in the sky that seemed to be high elevation. It did resemble just a star in the sky, but it was covering a lot of distance, and then it would stop on a dime, do curves, go back in the other direction. Like it was some, like it was like moving around in ways that didn't make sense for anything I had seen in the sky before. There was no flashy lights, nothing, nothing beyond that. Uh, I watched it with this group of people in their front yard for like a couple of minutes, and then at one point when it stopped or paused in the sky, then all of a sudden it just shot off like a shooting star and was gone. And I s- sat there and talked with these this group of people in their front yard for a few more minutes. Uh, and then I walked my dog back the rest of the way home. And that was the first time I was like, whoa, I wonder if this has anything to do with these meditations. Like, obviously, these people were looking at this thing before I even left Paul's house. Right, yeah, you were like, I didn't there. particularly, yeah. like, summon it into that spot. Yeah. I wasn't, like, intentionally in a spot waiting to have something revealed to me. But I was like, hey, maybe there was something that was telling me, like, you need to go watch that game with your buddy Paul tonight. Or... Like, I don't remember the circumstances around why I was there and what time I left or if there, what the reasoning behind that was, but I just know that all of a sudden that was my first experience of seeing something in the sky that I couldn't explain and was unlike anything I had seen in the sky before. Uh, I definitely maneuvered. If it was as high up as it seemed like it was, then it was covering like massive amounts of sky in a short, short amount of time, stopping, curving in its flight, changing directions, etc. Um... I didn't. That one didn't really stick with me that long, though. But something really crazy happened a couple months later. Um, actually, it was a, probably about a week before New Year's Eve uh, that year, which it was turning from 2010 to 2011. Uh, my wife at the time uh, bartended at a place part time at a place that it, she always worked on New Year's Eve because that was like one of the biggest nights of the year for this establishment. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so for a couple of years straight, I had been kind of flying solo on New Year's Eve. Um, she was going to be at work, but I was having in a meditation, I guess like a week before around that time I knew, and in my meditation, I felt something urging me not to make any plans for New Year's that, that year, that I should just stay home and spend as much 
time in my backyard as possible. So at at this you point in time, a, you kind of had a feeling. I just had like, a very had strong like, intuitive like, feeling like gotcha. y- you need to not go to any parties that night. Like you need to just stay home by yourself, do a meditation in the backyard. And I was like, man, that is like not something I really was wanting to hear because I normally like to go kick it with my friends, <laughs> and like, you know, on New Year's Eve. But it was strong enough that I, for some reason, and I had already been experiencing some really strange uh, things in my meditations, uh, starting to have some out-of-body experiences and kind of remote viewing or, um, not really remote viewing, I guess, but um, astral projection type experiences. Um, So I was just kind of rolling with it. At this point in my life... uh, I had gone, I was about to go freelance and I was making pretty good money with this jingle writing thing. And so when I didn't have to be doing that, I was putting a fair amount of time into exploring human consciousness in my own ways and psychedelics and psychonautics. And uh, I was just totally game to be like, all right, if something in me is telling me to stay at home and do a meditation in the backyard on New Year's Eve, then that's what I'm going to do. And so I did. Uh, and I'm just going to be completely transparent with the entire, all of the details of this experience. Um, I did consume a very small amount of psilocybin mushrooms. Okay. Um, but that's something I had done before and it was not an amount that would even typically cause someone to have visual hallucinations of any kind. It was a very small amount that just would kind of give you a body buzz. Um... And so I took a little those at around 9 p.m. and set uh, a blanket down in my backyard. It was pretty brisk that night, and it was calling for storms. So I was really kind of just trusting this intuition to, to go try to do an hour-long meditation in the cold on New Year's Eve on a night when they're saying it might storm. But I do. I set up my blanket, laid down, went through a middle, middle pillar type uh, visualization meditation that I was used to doing. Uh, that usually would last anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes to go through the full visualization of opening up each of the chakras and visualizing the color of that chakra. Uh, And it's a way of dissociating from the body a little bit. Um, So I I went through that whole process with my eyes closed, during which it felt like it was starting to like storm. Like the wind was starting to really swirl around me very dramatically. And... uh, I was very tempted to break my meditation before finishing the full visualization process. Um, but I stuck with it. And then re- as soon as it got to the end of of the process, I was like, all right, I need to go inside. Because it seems like it's about to like dump buckets of water. And it felt like a tornado almost was going to... It was so windy in my yard and so loud. And I opened my eyes, and I kid you not... I saw a a small cloud formation in the sky, like reflecting off moonlight or city lights or whatever. Uh, And it looked like it was in the shape of an arrow pointing to the right. And so I turned my head to the right as I'm still laying on this blanket, and I see about 25 to 30 lights in the sky. 25 to 30? Yeah. Okay. Um, And they looked like little comets, only they were flying independently. Um, I remember s- staring at them for a good like minute or two with just and kept repeating to myself what the fuck and uh, then I just like shook my head and stood up and like couldn't believe what I was seeing I just ne- I'd never seen anything like it in my life um, they weren't those quad beam high you know super luminescent spotlight things that they sometimes shoot from the ground on holidays. It was not fireworks. The, it, it looked like little comets that were swimming in the sky like fish in an aquarium. Okay. And I sat, I just remember kind of jumping up and down and being, and being like, this is amazing. I remember like kind of calling out to the sky like, this is amazing. And... Then it dawned on me, like, all right, no one's going to believe me if I try to describe this. And then it, like, definitely dawned on me as, like, and then if I tell them if I ate a 
few mushrooms before this. There's <laughs> there's no way they're gonna believe yeah. me. Like, Nobody's gonna believe people you. People are then. just gonna roll their right. eyes and be like, okay. Um, so I, this is kind of before cell phones and smartphones had really great cameras in them. And still but, using a flip phone at the time. Well, I had yeah. Um, I don't remember what kind of phone I had at the time, but what I definitely remember having was this thing called um, a Flip HD, which was an H a small pocket pocketable HD, you know, camera that could record video on it. And I ran inside and grabbed my Flip HD and went outside back to the backyard and filmed about 10 minutes of footage of these balls of light swimming, flying through the sky. And then I went back inside and my heart was pounding. I mean, this was like, I watched these things for long enough. And at this point, I I don't recall even feeling any type of psychedelic experience from the mushrooms. Uh, And I just remember sitting on my couch and just being like, this is crazy. And then I looked at the footage and then I, when I looked at the footage, I noticed that the battery was going to die soon on this on this device. So I went and plugged it in, and I rolled a joint, and then I went back out to my backyard to see if they were still there, and they were. Only there was less of them. At, by that point in time, there was only like 10 of them left in the sky, and then they slowly like faded away. And then the next thing I did was call my friend Tyler, who is actually Robbie's roommate, or they live in a, in a spot uh, together now. We've all like been into the this type of subject matter and playing music together for years. And I called my friend Tyler. And I was like, "What are you doing right now?" And he's like, "I'm at a party, but I'm kind of like done with this one. What are you doing?" And, he's like, and I was just like, "Man, I need somebody to come over to my house at some point tonight. Before I would love it if it was you. I just need you to look at something and tell me that it, it seems kind of nutty." And or tell me that it looks like that's just the shrooms, Joel. Or like, <laughs> let me know. Like, is it crazy that I what I filmed? Like, I need a second opinion All before right, so. I tell people, hey, I've got some crazy footage. I wanted a friend to come look at it and tell me, whoa. Like, either agree with me and be like, yeah, that's kind of nutty, or be like, Joel, it's just I think you were just like seeing tracers of light on something that was like part of the uh, New Year's Eve celebration. So you were doing. You were doing this transcendental meditation. You mm-hmm. got into the Stephen Greer stuff, which is kind of similar to transcendental meditation in a way. And then you're there New Year's Eve. You feel this compulsion to just go home when you could have gone out and partied like the rest of the world. Yeah. And you come home after, you know, take some mushrooms. And after a while, very little dose, you take you after a while, you see these 20 to 25 little lights in the sky. Yeah. And uh, so. The real, and so my buddy came over and brought a different friend with him named Matt Jones too and they both looked at the footage and they were both like yeah that's kind of crazy and the footage I will say on the HD was at that point in time even like this HD camera device it was it did no justice to what I saw and they still were kind of like whoa that's pretty wild like that's weird so I was like alright I just needed someone else to tell me that like to see this footage and be like yeah that's kind of crazy like what do you think that is I don't know what that is and so then I felt good that like, wow, not only did I see like a second UFO experience in less than a couple of months, um, I got footage of one. Like I'm about to, this, this shit's going to wind up on YouTube, you know, like right, I'm, I'm going right. to hit up yep. MUFON or something. <laughs> like, I got kind of excited about it. And I kid you not, like I showed, I showed the footage to a few friends over the course of a week or two. And I was kind of, I guess like maybe procrastinating a little bit, like trying to figure out like, you know, do I want to t- mention in this video that I was on shrooms? Like, what are my parents going to think? Are people going to think I'm, I've completely gone insane? Uh, but I was so happy to have the footage. And then a friend of mine named Jerry asked if he could borrow my Flip HD because he was going to film a wedding and someone was paying him to film a wedding. He was going to make some extra scratch. So I was like, okay. And I remember moving the footage, like going through the instruction manual of the Flip HD on how to move footage from the HD onto a laptop or a computer through a USB cord cable. I went through that, moved it onto a Dell laptop that my wife at the time owned. And I checked the footage and watched it on the computer. 
and then literally a week after I had moved it, that compute that laptop completely crashed, and I lost oh, the footage. Shit. Wow. Um, and wow. and then uh, I think maybe that entire experience and the, the meditation and experimenting with consciousness and psychonautics and whatnot may have p potentially led to why I got divorced soon after that like within a year of that experience i wound up divorced so there were certain and i think things that happened in your life after that yes occasion you that know. may have been i can't say that they're not connected do you feel like maybe because, that incident or that incident might have been a trigger to that happening i really it's hard it's so hard i don't want to speculate i just feel like i do know that my ex-wife started to get kind of spooked about some of uh -huh. the directions i was taking my own life right right um, because, you know, we were raised very religious and, you know, in, in some circles, anything that isn't Christian prayer is considered witchcraft. Mm -hmm. And I know that especially she had some relatives who would have considered the types of meditation techniques and stuff I was trying and that I was getting into herbalism and aspects of shamanism and stuff. They would have like said that I was in league with the devil. And, uh, yeah, very, very probably, which yeah. is, you know. I, I already knew that there were, I, was, I even have relatives that probably would think that. Like, So, you know, I can't judge the fact that she didn't like me tinkering with um, metaphysics. Tinkering with the, uh, with the demonic. Maybe. I mean, that's some might use that. In her, from her family members' points of view, Everything yes, is demons, kind yeah, of thought. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but long story short, and I'm about to pass the mic over to my friend Robbie. But pass the mic! <laughs> Part of the result of my divorce was that I moved out of the house that I actually saw that had that experience at okay. uh, and moved to a lake house in Sparta, Tennessee. Hmm. And my best friend, Robbie, uh, wound up renting you know, He and I rented it together and decided that that was a great place to continue our experiments in psychonautics. Um, and a couple of years into being there, I'm pretty sure it was almost two years from when I had that experience with the UFOs. It was either October or November of 2014. So I guess it would have been three years from the date almost of around the time I had done the CSETI protocols. And uh, I know that both of us were sober this particular night. And... Um, there were no there were no psychonautics. There were going no on psych at this well there point. were no psychedelics for okay. sure. Right. Um we both had just had a long day, I think. And I know that Robbie had been working uh clearing land for someone. Like he was working uh on the other side of the lake helping someone like develop their property that they were gonna like move to when they retired. And uh he had been working the land and been outside all day and I had been working on music in my studio. I, I very distinctly remember that we decided to watch a movie in the living room but, and had talked about how neither of us felt like going and getting any beer and we were all out of weed. So it was, so there was a, a stretch of time where it would be like kind of a rarity for me not to have at least a little bit of alcohol in a night or at least smoke a little bit of weed in a night. And, uh, but we had been kind of joking earlier this evening about how, like, wow, we're having like a sober night, <laughs> you know, a completely sober night. Well, let's watch a movie. And, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Robbie because you guys okay. have heard two of my stories. But All right. All right. All right. We'll get him over here because we'll, we'll, we'll switch out here. And, and Joel, if you do have anything to add to this, just, just come on to the mic. We probably, you know, should be able to pick it up. You know, don't. You, you don't scream across the room or anything. You're like, oh, uh, you know. so, all right. So we we got Robbie here. Introduce yourself. Hi guys. My name is Robbie. Uh, thanks for having us oh, on. Yeah. On the 300th episode, no less. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank um, you. I'll just jump straight into the experience for time. Um, like you said, we were sitting at home. It's probably about seven or eight o'clock in the evening. Uh, just in the middle of watching a movie. Um, Joel gets pretty like engrossed in uh, in films, and he's not paying too much attention. But while I'm watching, was there anything it, special that you were watching? Or? I don't even remember what we were watching. Okay, that doesn't really it matter. To me that I can't remember, but I think yeah. I think this overshadowed the film that we were watching, and so it didn't really matter to us anymore. Um, but we're sitting there, and I I hear in the distance like a what sounds like a 
a low flying plane, right? It's just pretty normal at first, but the rumble from that like kept growing and growing. It was getting louder, and at some point, my attention from the film broke, and I'm actually listening to the noise. And I'm thinking to myself, if this was a low flying plane, it should have passed by now. But it's only growing. What could this be? Is this something about to crash into my house? So at this point, at this point, he, Joel notices that I'm looking around the room. I'm looking up at the sky. I'm looking at the ceiling. You know, I'm looking around. I'm like, hey man, have you noticed that that plane hasn't passed yet? This is just getting louder. And around that point, like the house started rumbling, vibrating. The walls are vibrating. Pictures on the walls are shaking. Like stuff, or like stuff's moving, right? So at that point, we both jump off the couch, run outside. We have this big back deck, big bay windows, right? So slide the sliding doors open. We go outside, and about like a second or two after we get outside, again you're, you can hear all this going on. The sky above us starts becoming eclipsed. And this was like, you know, in the fall, like the leaves had, uh, you know, all fallen. So you got naked trees. Uh, when you look out from our back deck, you can see th where the ridge line goes down and you can see the opening where the lake is. And then you can see the other ridge line on the other side of the lake. So you can see out there, especially if there's like some moonlight, you can see the sky. Um, so with that, you see this thing start eclipsing the sky above you, just black. And it's going slow. And we're watching it come from over our house, and it's not stopping. Like, there's still more and more of whatever ship this is, right? What, what was the shape of it? What did it so look like? So, at first, we couldn't make out a shape because it was just blackness coming from over us. Like, it just looked like a sheet, right? Okay. So, that's going over us. And I'm noticing at the same time that I'm not hearing any sound or noise coming from it itself. It was like the ground itself was rumbling. So the noises that I'm hearing was coming from the ground, uh, which I took note of, which spooked me. Um, but this thing finally clears the house, and I'd say it's probably like more than a football field long um, and probably about a football field wide. This thing was wide. But once it passed over the house, you could see a faint little like line of red light going around the edge of it. And it almost looked like, uh, say, like you take a book and the spine is uh, facing the ground. And so it's a book flying like vertical this way, right? So it had a huge flat side to it that was much wider, which, you know, if you put it on its side, it's a big ass like barge is what like we came to the conclusion of. Okay. So it looked like a big space barge traveling on its side. Um, but we see it, the direction that it's going is not a normal flight path. Um, you usually have planes, I would say, if I'm not turned around, coming from like the northwest flying over the lake. So you have planes flying over the lake, but this direction coming from right over our house, over the lake, I never see planes fly this way. But we see it going out into the direction that it's heading, and we notice this glowing orb that's over the lake already that we didn't notice at first. And it's kind of loosely flying in a uh, like a figure eight pattern, very loosely, just kind of hovering out over the lake. And we see this thing fly out over the lake. And once it gets over by where the orb is, the orb comes kind of close to it. And they both travel off to each with each other past the horizon until we can't see it anymore. And in the moment, we're watching this happen. And I'm not thinking to run into the house to grab my phone. I know that like we're going to run out of time. We're just in the moment watching this, and we want to take in common, every second. That's a common thing. That's but a common it did thing. Almost, yeah. It did almost feel like we were in a trance. It's like neither of us thought to even go get our phones or cameras or anything. It's like we just were transfixed. We well, were. A lot, a lot of people feel like it's. It feels right. like it's normal. Well, it's going on. Yeah. Yeah. But so. it's not only. It's not till later that you're like. Holy just shit, to add to the weird. description, mm -hmm. I would say it was like the monolith from 2001. Yeah, it looked oh, like that's that. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Like a, a rectangular. Dark rectangle. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so when watching it, like we we weren't saying anything to each other. We were completely silent, right? And then after it passed, we didn't notice. We'd laugh about it uh, afterwards, but we both went back inside and didn't say anything to each other for another 10 minutes until one of us finally was just, hey, man. Did you just experience the same thing I did? And then we go went over the details with each other. Like, everything matched up. We were like, okay, 
that we definitely saw that that we experienced that um for some reason i always felt and felt in the moment again i was there present taking it in uh i didn't feel like any nothing told me in my gut that it was extraterrestrial it felt so military in a way really and the speed that this thing was going for something that massive in the sky like gravity doesn't it i can't comprehend what technology it would take to keep something that large going that slow right over the tree lines like this thing is hovering right over the tree lines at a very slow speed it wasn't more than 300 feet above our heads yeah it was not more than 300 it was like 150 200 feet above the tree line it was like close very close huge and flew slowly and it did rumble the house it did sh shake and we heard it approaching i didn't at first robbie tr truly i just noticed him looking around and i was like what is going on what is bothering you quit being fidgety i'm trying to watch this movie <laughs> and he was like dude you hear that you hear that <laughs> and then as soon as he said that i was like oh yeah there's a yeah it sounds like some a plane flying over our house and he's like i've been listening to it for 45 seconds to a minute already and i was like yeah. oh and so that yeah i mean the reason why I like, like sometimes I I'll, I'll want to tell a friend this story and I'll tell him and I'll be like, next time you see Robbie, ask him about it and you'll see like he's gonna tell the same story that I told because yeah. we were right there, like it was super weird. I don't know why I didn't think to record it. I don't even know why. Normally I feel like I would remember. I would have sat down and been like, I'm gonna write down the date. I'm gonna describe this <laughs> pen and on paper. And like, cause it was freaking crazy. So for a, a, a post uh, experience detail, one of our uh, next door neighbors, um, he's a mechanic for Black Hawks, and it's always, we we feel like we've picked up on patterns sometimes. Like a uh, he disappears, like not disappears. He's got a house in town, but like you see him not coming out to his like house for, like a couple of weeks before some news breaks out right and we're always able to be like uh yeah something's going on he's having to, like get the helicopters together he knows things ahead of us right military man um so we called him up just to ask you're like hey do you know anything about we're gonna sound crazy as your neighbors but do you know anything about any experiments with these huge ships that are flying over okay and you know he likes to have a good time so he jokingly said you can't tell us uh yes or no but they have a lot of things going on, which I thought was just funny. The thing with the orb is weird because that's like not necessarily something technological, but it interacted with this right. seemingly right. technological ship. Right. Yeah. And the movement of that orb, it didn't do anything like uh, it didn't have any crazy movements that wouldn't be able to be replicated. Like, I mean, a drone, even like what year this was, like even like a simple drone could make the same movements and it'd just be some light. So it wasn't, it wasn't like it just shot off anywhere or did anything yeah. that, you know, was out of the realm of possibility of the technology we have. Um, but it was strange that it met up with this ship and kind of partnered um, up. Those orbs are a lot of people see that as more, more of a spiritual phenomenon. When we say orb, um, it was through trees over a lake at night. So, so just a light. It, it was a ball much. of light, okay. which I wouldn't say it wasn't an orb, but I'm not. Okay. We're not sure what it was. We can't say that it was like plasma or yeah. it was a roundish, whitish light. That Our seemed eyes to picked float, up on it as a round light. It seemed yeah. to float across the lake and join up with this big black rectangle. Um, oh, so there is something I'd like to add. For years since the event where I saw the crazy comet-tailed fish light things in the sky and then this big black rectangle. Um, I've scanned U YouTube for various UFO videos and tried to describe those types, you know, giant black rectangle UFO, like once a month at least since then, just to see if anyone's got footage of any. And, uh, see if know, anything pops up that's... That, would, to us that we would we see it and be like, that is what I saw. That is the same thing. Um, and over the last couple of years, I've started to find some links and some videos and some footage or some photographs that pretty closely resemble it. Um, and I found this one article uh, that a lady wrote on Reddit where she was 
seem to have knowledge through a relative of what they were calling anti-gravity space platforms. Um, and that the military did have them and they used them to transport, um, you know, other types of machines and classified objects out of the view of the public. So I was thinking, you know, well, what, what would one of those look like if it wasn't flying flat but was up on its side? Could it, could it fly in either direction? If it's not transporting something, maybe it flies in whatever direction it feels it cloaks its existence more. But then in my pursuit of trying to find videos for that, one day I ran randomly found a video that the first clip of is pretty much exactly what I saw on that New Year's Eve night, too. And I've got the link for it. I'll, I'll show you guys in a minute. I'll pull up the video, and it's like, it is the same thing that I saw. Mm. And you'll see. You'll see it, and you'll be like, that does look like fish made out of fish comets flying and <laughs> swimming so, through the sky. A couple of things. You guys had a shared experience. Mm. Okay, that's important because you can, you both can validate each other on what you saw. The second thing is you did not even think to get footage of it which is very common because a lot of that's a big one of the big critiques about the UFO, about the, the field of ufology is that why don't we have more footage well because had i ran into the house i knew i would have missed out on the whole thing right you would have yeah. missed out on the whole thing and, and that's that's a very that's a very common aspect too in contrast um, to this it might not have actually shown up well on a phone camera. sure although yeah. In retrospect, now I think about how footage can be analyzed and how you yeah. can put infrared filters on it, and that would have worked. But. Joel, do you think that your experience? This was in 2011, right? So this happened. The 2010 to 20, yeah, it was about to turn okay. 2011 when I saw the balls of light. Right, and then when the next when this experience happened with the two of you, that home about 2014. That was 20, 2014, yeah. so a few years after. Do you feel that there's a connection between the first experience and the second experience? I have no clue because the balls of light that I saw in the sky actually got a vibe that they were not mechanical. Mm -hmm. I, for whatever reason, I felt that they were interdimensional or something, and that they were creatures. It really is what I felt. As like maybe this is what angels are, or like I don't know, but they definitely moved Food like thought, like yeah. fish or like maybe a type of bird. And uh, it didn't. I didn't at all think those are machines. But the thing that flew over our house in Sparta, the big black rectangle, I definitely it's felt definitely, like that was, was made out of some hard material, metal. You know, like yeah. Um, and was making a sound. The, the balls of light made no sound whatsoever. Um, so they definitely seemed like two different things. The thing that I say might in some way connect them is the idea of synchronicity or that you can through meditation or through like intention put yourself on a course in life that might inadvertently or in for for some unknown reason put you in the right place at the right time for certain experiences yeah yeah that's a very good point well is it did you want to ask or Sophia? No, that's just real interesting. Yeah, that's, um, and having you know, having two people see something simultaneously is really the. Mm -hmm. the we haven't experienced anything. I, I I'm still living out at the lake house. I have space in, in town, and then out there, I still haven't experienced anything like that since. Nothing since. So, do you think that was Joel's influence? You know, since I, he went through that program. <laughs> <laughs> Anything's a possibility. Well, I mean, certain things can, I think, be be attached to like certain people. And when I say that, I mean that that the attachment idea has a negative connotation. But I mean, I think that there is a there there is a there's something to that. We're definitely both prone to being interested in paranormal um, conspiracy theories of certain ilk, and yeah. uh, and we both have had lots of strange experiences in life. You know, like before Robbie and I ever met. You know, Robbie's told me since then that growing up, he's he had he's had some experiences of seeing shadow people and stuff like you know things that we both have since heard other people talk about on you know rebroadcasts of Art Bell on Coast to Coast, right. and stuff like that, where you have these experiences in life and you think to yourself, oh, I can't tell anyone about that or people are just gonna think i'm weird 
or my parents are going to think I'm possessed or whatever. But then through life, you wind up hearing on, you know, as blogs happen, as you discover some weird AM radio show called Coast to Coast AM, or you find certain books at the library, and then eventually you're like, oh, there's a lot of people actually who have had these similar types of experiences. Yep. We've been um, we've been there too. We know how that we, feels. Do I want to go like try to meet these other people, or <laughs> yeah. is it just there enough can, comfort knowing that they exist? Or do I want to try to find out what's behind these types of experiences? There can be a lot of a lot of people with a you know a sensitivity to to these things, or you know the veil is very thin with certain people at times. You know. Yeah. Do you want to relate one of these shadow people stories? Uh you know maybe another time. Okay. Um, it is something I experienced since uh, since I was a little kid. Do you ex- still experience it now, or is it more? Kind of- yeah, from time to time, and when it happens, it's usually uh, for like a small amount of time, like yeah. maybe for like a month that it's happening. Um, is there a sleep paralysis aspect to it? No, this is while I'm awake. Okay. Like in the living room, on the couch, uh, yeah. or driving the car, you'll see it. Yeah. 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 The the shadow people thing. I watched that. I watched that documentary the, on the, the shadow nightmare. people. The nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. And like, it's That's a good one. it's interesting because like a lot of the experience they're having, like I I I've witnessed myself, mm-hmm. but not not in the setting that they have. Like they wake up, they see this thing in the room, especially the I guess the the main character of that the man with the hat, yeah, the hat and man. the red eyes. Right. I've never seen red eyes. I've right. never seen the man with the hat. But You've seen like hazy kind of ghostly like translucenty kind of figures that kind of show up. And yeah, like they're walking almost like. Two dimensions are kind of like bumping up against each other. Yeah, it's almost just like the frequency just changes a little bit, and all of a sudden you start seeing something that's there. You know, okay. you don't know if like you're dehydrated or <laughs> if yeah. you're cracking into another dimension. You don't know what's happening. You just but you just see it's it. It's kind of like television static in a yeah, way. Yeah, just kind of pops up sometimes. But when it does pop up, it seems to happen a lot for a little bit of time, and then you don't see it for months or a year or two, and that's one of the strange things about it. But yeah, I don't experience uh, sleep paralysis and, and experience the, the shadow people the way that I've heard the other stories. Yeah. That's, yeah. Not, my, that's yeah, not my experience. It's, yeah, and it, it's not necessarily associated with, with sleep paralysis. It is associated with sleep paralysis, yeah. but you don't have to have sleep paralysis for to, right. to have a shadow people experience. Um, okay. I haven't experienced them being uh, malevolent, and they kind of seem playful. Playful, or you know, okay. sometimes I want to, I want to take it and interpret it in ways, but yeah. I usually just leave it for. Well, that was crazy, you know. Right, right, right. It's just an experience. I don't have that answers you, for it, so yeah. as, you know why why yeah. come up with things for it. Yeah. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for coming on and and uh, being a part of this. Yeah, and, appreciate uh, it. In studio. In studio, and we got a video too. All right, um, guys, we will be back on Conspiracy Normal for the. Um, main event so see you in a bit